So um, we've got our quiz on, on, on television on, uh, on Wednesday. I'm running down our study guide. That history of television as a cultural forum, I'm going to talk about that today. Changes in the cultural construction of identity in the history of situation comedies, I'm going to talk about that today. I would like to talk about the economics of broadcast television today, and I'm going to try, but we'll see how it's going to go. The history of TV news, including all those things, I'm going to try and hit those today, so that's pretty darn um, ambitious. And the significance of the Telecommunication Act and the rise of cable TV and the decline of broadcast, how about I leave that on you to get out of the chapter, okay? And I'm going to try and cover as much of this other stuff as possible. So, television culture is American culture in such a profound way. It's the culture that we spend the most amount of time with. It's what we share the most and what we have the most in common, right? So the odds are, if we have cultural overlap between us, it's because we've watched some of the same TV shows. You know, everybody's watched The Simpsons. Most of you have seen South Park. I'll bet most of you have seen Seinfeld. Um, friends. I mean, there's these, you know, 30 Rock now is the show that I like, you know, and then there's some that are popular, but maybe less so with you guys, but I mean, going through the past, I'm thinking about The Sopranos and Sex in the City. And what are the shows that you like again? Walking Dead. What's that? Walking Dead. Walking Dead now is a hot show. Anyway. So, um, television culture is an important culture for us, right? Although it's shifting, right? We're not watching TV in the way that we used to. Um, the internet has changed everything about, about the way that we watch. Um, but so, let me take these, these first couple of, of points off the, the study guide. First, the idea of, of television as a cultural form, and then the idea of uh, television in the construction of, of identity. Um, the idea of television as a cultural form, when I use that phrase, what I'm saying is that television acts like this big public square where we have a discussion about the way things are and the way they ought to be. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a cultural forum, a forum for discussing things, right? And you can see it, particularly when you look through the history of the sitcom over the decades since the, the 1950s. You can see it's like these, these ideas come up and get bandied about. And at the moment, maybe it just looks like, oh, it's just a goofy, stupid TV show. But then when you look back at them with sort of a historical perspective, you can see that sitcoms in particular seem to function as this sort of testing ground for new social ideas. And when you watch reruns of old television shows, even if it's a show that you don't know particularly when it was on and you just know it was from the past, obviously, you're probably mostly pretty good at guessing what decade it was from. Like if I showed you almost any show, probably almost 100% of you would be able to guess with 100% accuracy at least what decade it was from, 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, because you have a sense of the cultural flavor of the times, the sorts of things that people talked about and the way that they talked about them. And particularly what you see in the family sitcoms is what we might think of as, as identity, the, the sorts of types of people that, that there are, and how they are defined culturally, and how they interact with each other, what are the range of possible characters that you see for certain types of people, right? Particularly in, in, in for, for my sensibility, for my interest, gender is a big one. You know, what does it mean to be a man? What does it mean to be a woman? And race is another one. What does it mean to be white? What does it mean to be black? And this idea that somehow on television it was like the testing ground for Americans to try and come together and figure out what they thought about these things. And our ideas about those things, those very fundamental things, change quite a bit over time. And you can, you can see it. 
And I don't think of it just as a reflection, this idea that television just reflects what's going on. It's something, there's more of a give and take aspect to it. You know, people, you know, sure, in one sense, think reality doesn't get created completely on, on TV, obviously, and the television writers and producers are playing with the ideas and sensibilities that exist in the time that they're writing the show. But on the other hand, for many people, oftentimes, television is their sort of portal to engaging with the world around them. It might be one of the places where they first encounter new types of people that they haven't met before, you know. Certainly when I was growing up, I think I've mentioned this to you, I, you know, I, was, I grew up in the suburbs of Chicago, and it was mixed Jewish and Catholic. Those were the two types of kids that I went to, to school with. And, you know, didn't encounter black people hardly at all. Not in grammar school, not in junior high school. There were, were there some black kids in my high school? I, don't even, I didn't know any. I didn't know any. I met some working in the summers in Chicago in the city. And then in college, there were some black kids in my, in my dorm that I got to be friends with. But before then, I would have to admit that my ideas of black kids when I was a kid came from watching TV. You know, Good Times, you know, which was this great TV show, by the way, that featured a, a, a black working class family living in um, the projects in, in Chicago, if I remember the green area. Um, but anyway, I, I'm, I'm sure that a lot of you will find yourselves to be in a, a similar position. So anyway, so what I wanted, and, and by the way, did I give the talk here the first day where I talk about like the theories of communication and the, the cultural theory and the, the, the transmission view of communication? This, the, that, that, that ritual view or the, the cultural approach to, to studying communication emphasizes the idea that communication is a process where meaning is actively created. And that's the kind of thing I'm trying to get at today by right? trying to get you to think about the historical construction of identity in the television sitcoms. It's the idea that our identities are actually culturally created and that television is, is not just a reflection of the way that the world is, but is part of a community process where we experiment and try out different meanings. And then those meanings sort of become real for us. So anyway, let me just, if what I'm going to do today, I, I wish I could just show you clip after, I wish we could just watch a full half hour episode of every TV show that I, I want to talk about today, but it's just not realistic and there's a lot of stuff I want to cover. So I'm probably not going to actually show clips today, I'm probably just going to talk a lot. And some of the shows I'm going to talk about, some of you have seen and some of them probably you, you haven't seen, but hopefully even if you haven't seen it, You'll get a sense of the show from what I say about it, and maybe some of you will be interested in watching some old shows on, online and blogging about them and that sort of thing. That would be great. So, um, 1950s sitcoms. First thing I'll say about them is people have this idea about the 1950s. You probably have this idea about the 1950s. The 1950s. It was a more innocent time, right? Yeah. People were more decent to each other. Kids were more polite. They didn't have the kinds of troubles that we have today. And everyone running around and going crazy and having sex and taking drugs and arguing with each other and stuff like that. And that's not true, actually. All those things did happen in the 1950s. They just weren't on TV. Yeah, there was all kinds of things going on in the 1950s, just like today, you know? licentiousness and adultery and lack of sobriety and partying and disrespect of, 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 of people across all kinds of lines. But that wasn't what was on the sitcoms. And since we get so many of our ideas about reality from watching TV, people think that life in the 1950s really was what it was like and leave it to be the world. But it just wasn't like that, you know. It just, it's a myth, you know, that you sort of grow up with because it's so easy to absorb these ideas from the 1950s. 
And I'll just point out, and I, I think I've said this before, I mean, in some ways, the 1950s were a great time. The, the economy was, was booming, and the United States had come out of two decades of terrible difficulty, and they were enjoying the largest economic expansion in the history of the country, and we had just made the world safe for democracy, and generally speaking, we were feeling really good about things. But on the other hand, there was a lot of social tension right that was also existing right and, and, and coming to the surface right the African Americans I think I've, I've mentioned this who you know served with such honor in the Second World War making this world safe for democracy came home thinking that they were going to have to they were going to be able to enjoy democratic civil liberties in America and instead there was a racist backlash against them just like there was sort of a sexist backlash against the women who were encouraged to move into the private sphere, excuse me, into the public sphere and work during the Second World War. And then when the war was over, there was kind of a, a, an anti-feminist backlash against that thing, and a lot of pressure for women to you know, go home and, and make babies. And of course, a lot of that happened, but not all the women wanted to go home and make babies. Some of the women liked having a job and working and having independence and that sort of thing. And those are the sorts of tensions that were going on in the 1950s that weren't really reflected in broadcast TV, certainly not in the, in the sitcoms very well. Um, and, and part of that has to do with the fact that the broadcast TV was in the public airwaves and there was this sense that it had to not offend anybody because it was for everybody and so it had to be entertainment that was you know, totally not offensive, which made a kind of sterile, not very challenging type of, of, of culture, although there was some interesting things going on in the 1950s TV. I mean, most of it looked like even to be your father knows best kind of sitcoms, which were very screwed down, you know what I mean? It was very authoritarian, you know, that, that name of, of the TV show Father Knows Best kind of lends itself to the aesthetic of the whole family sitcom oeuvre in the 1950s, this idea that that was what, you know, Father Knows Best, that's what all the sitcoms were about. You know, it was, it was kids making mistakes and maybe sometimes the mom making a mistake and, you know, doing something wrong and the father kind of coming in and restoring order and closing up the, the narrative at the end of the semester. Just small, domestic, you know, stifling to our sensibilities, I think, today when you look at it, it's slow, you know, can we compare to the, the sorts of entertainment shows that we like to watch today. Um, but, you know, they weren't, there were some interesting things were going on, I think. Um, you know, one show that really stands out for me is uh, the I Love Lucy show. Oh, stop me, did I talk about this already? Mm -hmm. okay. So I Love Lucy is a show, how many people have seen it? Okay. Oh good, a lot of you have seen I Love Lucy, that's amazing that so many people have seen I Love Lucy. And here's an interesting fact, you know, all right, so Lucille Ball was like one of the two biggest TV stars in the, in the 1950s. The other one was uh, Jack Benny. Considered Mr. Television. He was the one, right? Was it Jack Benny? It was, they called him Mr. Television. I wasn't around in the 50s, despite what you might think. So, <laughs> but this is the thing about I Love Lucy. Um, and I, I think it's worth thinking about I Love Lucy in terms of that historical context that I just tried to paint in a few broad strokes with you. This idea that what was going on with women in the 1950s, you know? On the one hand, it was, there was that, that interesting, well, of course, you know, you have to remember that there was this sort of unfolding of women's rights going on that you don't hear a lot about, you know. Um, but remember that women used to be considered like property. They didn't own property. They sort of were property. You know, they were owned by their fathers until they were sort of owned by their husbands, basically. You know, they themselves weren't able to inherit property. In the 1920s is when they finally got the right to vote. It wasn't that long ago, you know, and they had to work really hard for that and organize a lot. And there was, you know, protests and big marches and things like that. And part of our history, I feel like, it 
has an, it doesn't get told in pop culture, and it becomes invisible, and we develop a kind of cultural amnesia. I think about the, the history of the women's movement and how hard they had to work and organize. <clears throat> By the way, do you know which one group of people? I'll say this to you guys. Was particularly instrumental in the women getting the right to vote in the United States. There's one group of Americans that really stand out in terms of their ability to organize and push for it. Once they decided that that was in their interests, then the Mormons. Yeah, it was the Mormons, totally. The first two states that won the right to vote were Utah and Wyoming. And it was like a big, it was like a competition between the two. You know, the two states, who was going to win it first? And why only keep you guys by two days? But anyway, so 30 years, 35 years later of just that step, right? And then you have that amazing transformative moment of the Second World War where everything went out topsy-turvy, out of necessity. And the women were in the factories during the Second World War in large numbers. And then afterwards, we're left with, well, now what, you know? And you can see the sort of, when you watch those 1950s TV shows, and look at 1950s movies. You ever see the movie, My Fair Lady? Yeah. It's not a great movie. But if you think about it, it's so sexist. It's like, how dare they talk to her that way and treat her that way and talk about her that way, you know what I mean? But that, those were the attitudes that, 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 that people had about gender, right? And so into that context comes the I Love Lucy show. And you know, I Love Lucy, if you haven't seen it, you know, it, it, it's, it's, it's about a married couple. The husband has a TV show. He's an entertainer. He's a Cuban musician and like an MC, and he has this variety show. His wife is named Lucy. And she always wants to be on the show, but she's not allowed to be on the show. She's not allowed to work. She's not allowed to drive a car. Lucy doesn't, or, you know, Ricky doesn't want her doing any of those things. And so, right away, on the one hand, it's incredibly sexist, right? Because it's all about how Lucy's not allowed to work. You know how, and every show is. Half the episodes were about Lucy trying to get a job and Ricky saying, no, you're not allowed to get a job. So right away you've got that, that sensibility where it would be okay for a husband to tell his wife, no, you can't work. No, you can't drive a car. I mean, if you think about it, it sounds like Sharia law. You know what I mean? Like, might as well put a burqa on her. So very sexist in that sense. But on the other hand, if you think about it, Man, every episode had Lucy trying to kick her way out of the private sphere and move into the public sphere. She never learned her lesson. And the thing that drove the narrative was Lucy trying to get on TV. The character that got all the laughs was Lucy. The character that drove the narrative was Lucy, right? The show was called I Love Lucy. The name of the woman who played Lucy was Lucy, <laughs> the most famous person in America, or the most famous woman in America, the most loved woman in America. And everybody knew when they were watching the TV show that on the TV show, Lucy doesn't get to be on TV. But in reality, Lucy is on TV. We're watching her right now, you know? So in that sense, I would make the argument that there was, a, some people would say that the I Love Lucy show was incredibly sexist. And in some ways, it was. You know, I had a, a media studies professor in college who showed us a, an episode of I Love Lucy one, where at the end of the episode, Ricky pulled Lucy over his lap and gave her a spanking. Yes, that was how the, the show ended, with Lucy getting a spanking. You know, so incredibly sexist in that sense. But on the other hand, it was also every week. It was, it was, a, it was an image of an empowered woman who was refusing the strictures of her closed gender identity and trying to kick her way out of it, right? So just, there's a complexity to TV sometimes that I think we don't give it the credit that it deserves because there's so much junk on TV and everyone's always making fun of how crappy TV is. 
But anyway, so there's that example, and I just want to keep moving forward. I, I could spend a whole semester just talking about this kind of stuff, but you know, and I, I think it's worth it to think about the the character or the, the well, the roles that the actress Mary Tyler Moore had on television in the 1960s and 1970s. She's this really interesting, popular figure. First, you know, she played the wife on the Dick Van Dyke show. She was the wife of a, she was a stay-at-home mom who was the wife of a, of, a, of a writer of a television comedy show. She was very pretty. She had a look like Jackie O. Um, and there was something about her personality on the Dick Van Dyke show where it was like she was a stay-at-home mom, but she was no Donna Reed. She had sort of a strong personality, and she was just incredibly likable. Everybody just, you know, there was just something really likable about her character on that, that show. And she was just very modern-seeming, and she was just very much this kind of 1960s cool woman, you know? The Dick Van Dyke show didn't feel nearly as sexist as the other shows around it at the time. And then, in 1973, there debuted a new show starring Mary Tyler Moore called, like in the spirit of I Love Lucy, it was called The Mary Tyler Moore Show. And she played a character, I'm trying to remember how they did it in the show. I think they originally wanted to have her be like a divorcee, but that was so risque at the time that I think that they made it so that she was she was engaged, but then the, the engagement didn't work out. I can't remember exactly what happened, but it was something like that. And the show, and basically, she, the, on, on the first episode, she moves to Minneapolis, she rents an apartment, and she gets a job. And that had never been on TV before, a single woman living on her own with a job. And it was very controversial when it came out, and some people picketed and boycotted and things like this, and there was this all kinds of implications about what would be her sexual relationships and that sort of thing. Um, but she became this kind of early 1970s, I would call it a white middle class feminist icon, because that's what she was, and she had white middle class feminist problems, you know what I mean? Which is to say that she had a job, but she had to worry about getting respect on the job. And, and it was a good job, but would she make as much money as a man would make doing that same job, that sort of thing. And if you watch the show, it was a, it was a funny show. It was a really popular show. Um, it had a, a really good ensemble cast, including Ed Asner, who played Lou Grant, that they did a spin-off on him later. And he was the sort of gruff editor of the television newsroom, and Mary got a job as a producer on the new show. And Gavin McLeod, I think the guy's name is, he played Captain Student later on The Love Boat. He was a writer. And then there was just this whole, there was a really good, really good, good cast on that, on that show. But what I like to point out to people and sort of mirror it against I Love Lucy, because in I Love Lucy you have this incredibly sexist looking situation, right, where you think it was a sexist sitcom and it was based on a sexist premise that a woman wasn't allowed to work, right? And yet in that very sexist show, you had kind of a feminist image of Lucy always kicking her way out of that, right? Well, in Mary Tyler Moore, in a way, it's a kind of mirror opposite of that. Because you've got this very feminist concept now. It's a feminist context. It's, you've got a woman living on her own in the city, independent, supporting herself with with a job and taking care of herself, and she doesn't need a man to protect her or provide for her, right? So in that sense, it's this very kind of 1970s feminist type of image. But if you watch the show, you realize that on the first episode, she walks into the newsroom and she gets a job, and you know the job that she gets is she's working under this very stereotypical, I would call him a father knows best kind of authoritarian, traditional, gruff, non-emotional male, right? There's all these characters around, and all these characters that are around, they have jobs, and they're mature adults, but they act like children, 
right? The, the newscasters and the lady who has the cooking show and, and the women that, that Mary knows in, in the apartment, they, they act like children in relationship to Lou, who's like the father of the new studio, and Mary, who is in a way like a very traditional type of woman. She's pretty, she's emotional, she's nurturing, she's gentle and kind to everybody that she meets. She's the kind of woman that you go to with your problems. She's like a mom, right? And so the Mary Tyler Moore show did the opposite of what the I Love Lucy show did because it presented this very sort of feminist situation and they, in, in my words, they did a kind of ideological clawback of the potential feminist threat to this by placing Mary inside a very traditional looking patriarchal structure, you know. So anyway, again, it's, it's this sense that you can you can see when you look at the history of the sitcoms, I Love Lucy, to the Dick Van Dyke show, to the Mary Tyler Moore show. It's like for that 15 to 20 year period, it's like America was having this discussion about what could women do. And oh, they can't do this, but oh, a little bit of this. And oh, well, we're going to let them do this, but not too much of that. You know what I mean? That's what it looks like from I Love Lucy to the Mary Tyler Moore show. And of course, now, you know, what I'm, I'm not. I'm not giving like a comprehensive vision of the history of gender identity in, in television. I'm just kind of taking a little walking tour and pointing out a few interesting shows, you know, that, that come to mind that are indicative of the idea that we're having this conversation about gender and every decade it feels different, you know. And the, the next show along that, those lines that, that come to mind for me that's um, illustrative in this kind of dynamic is the Roseanne show. You ever see Roseanne? And again, I mean, in a way I'm just realizing this as I'm talking about it. So, I Love Lucy, Mary Tyler Moore, Roseanne, these three iconic female stars of TV shows, and in each of their cases, their characters are, na are reflect their real names in real life. And for all of them, there's a bleed over. You know, like there's something in the, the character of Lucille Ball that is in Lucy Ricardo. There's something in the character of Mary Tyler Moore that is just like Mary on the TV show, and for sure Roseanne is that way. And if you don't know the story of Roseanne Barr, she was born in Salt Lake City, and, and she, she grew up in a very unhappy situation. I know that there was alcohol and abuse and that sort of thing, and she didn't do well culturally around here when she was a girl, and she grew up angry. And uh, had a lot of had a dysfunctional marriage and just really had a hard life. And at a certain point in the 1980s, she started doing stand-up comedy. I remember watching her on cable before she was famous, before she had the TV show. She had this one sort of breakout stand. You know, she got discovered as a stand-up comic, and they did an HBO special on her, and then she just became famous. And I remember it so well because she just came out on stage. There was a microphone a glass of water and an ashtray. And she chain smoked and drank water and told horrible stories about her life, but in a funny way, you know? Because she, she developed this sense of humor about it, and she was just exploring what happened to her, you know? And she made jokes about getting beaten up and abused and this kind of thing. And she, when she got big, they, they gave her the offer to do a TV show, and she wanted to do a TV show that was, that came out of the stories that she was telling as a stand-up comic, and she came up with the, the Roseanne show. And you can see it's like a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a working class, hard life show. You know what I mean? It's not upper middle class problems, it's lower middle class problems. It's are we going to be able to pay the electric bill? The kids aren't listening to me. I'm having some huge fight with my daughter. Oh, and that huge fight that I'm having with my daughter, it ain't going to get resolved <laughs> in this episode. <laughs> it's going to continue on to the next episode, and then it's going to continue on to the next episode, where it's still not going to be resolved. It's just going to kind of go under, underground for a while while we we'll deal with some other things, and there'll be this subtextual tension that might come up again next season. You know, I mean, that's how that show was. It was a, 
The first two or three seasons in particular, before Roseanne flipped out and there was all these problems on the set, it was a really good show. Smart and hard and, and you know, to me it was like, it, it was a significant development past um, the Mary Tyler Moore show in the sense that, number one, not all women are beautiful. And I think it's good that you have a regular looking woman on the television, you know, because there are people come in all shapes and sizes, you know. And uh, I, I thought it was good the way that they just, and it, you know, it was a way, it's, it's that time of, and some people bemoan this in American culture, but I, I think it's a good thing that, that we kind of like to go confessional. And we like to air our dirty laundry and talk about all the things that are going on. And I think that that's a good impulse, you know. Unlike, for example, the culture of the 1950s. And we get this idea that everything was fine in the 1950s. It's because nobody talked about anything in the 1950s. Dad was an alcoholic, he didn't say anything about it. Daughter gets molested, nobody says anything. You know, it's not like by the time of the 80s we became this, you know, confessional culture where we're all telling everything that happened. And Roseanne is kind of part of that. Anyway, she was strong. The show was named after her. Um, she made a lot of mistakes on the show. They had ugly fights, but there was a there was a the sense that, that love would sort of solve the problems in the Roseanne show at the end. I mean, there was that kind of redemption in the end that even though they said horrible things to each other, they loved each other a lot. Kind of like a, a similar, well, not similar, very different show, but in a way that something had that. A show that had that kind of uh, dynamic was Married with Children, you know, because they, they were awful. They were awful to each other. It was like so the opposite of what you saw in the families of the 1950s and 60s. But in a way, it was joking on those kinds of things, you know. And in a way, even though it made fun of those kinds of conventions, it actually stuck to them. Because the one time that the Bundys would stop fighting in saying the most horrible things you could imagine to each other is when anyone from the outside attacks someone from the family. Then they would just like unite and destroy that person, you know. Anyway, interesting show. So somebody had their hand up over there. Okay. I was just going to say that Roseanne was one of the first shows I could remember where they actually did talk about stuff that was like a big issue. Like I was watching reruns the other day yeah. and one was about being racist and one was talking about abortion when she was pregnant with like their latest child. Right. They were debating on if they wanted to abort the child. Yeah. And that was one of the first shows I remember growing up watching where they actually talked about like big issues about that. Where this is supposed to be a comedic show, but they would still talk about that and it was like a dramatic show all of a sudden. Right. And right. so I just remember that. Yeah, I think Roseanne's kind of underappreciated. And I think that over time, people in the future will look back at it with a little bit more respect. There's a very good way show. TV got started getting a lot more interesting in the 80s. Yeah. Uh, I think a show that I, I think of as we're talking about this is All in the Family. Right? You had the traditional mother who, like, the, the dad would just berate all day long and tell her how terrible she was as a wife. And then you had the young daughter who was coming of age and realizing that women had all this potential and that she could do things that, like, her mom couldn't do. And she was trying to convince her mom to to, to, to break away and to be your own person, but her mom refused because she was stuck in that traditional like mode that she was the wife and subject to her husband. Right. I'm glad that you brought up All in the Family. One of the most significant TV shows that's ever been on, one of the best TV shows that's ever been on, and it's really interesting to think about All in the Family in terms of those things that we're talking about right now, both in terms of gender, as you pointed race. out, but also race, and also age. That was, to me, that was the big thing when I look back at All in the Family. And if you don't know, so All in the Family had its debut, I can't remember if it was like 71 or 72, but I remember it. I was a kid. I was born in 64, so I would have been like 7 or 8 and 71, 72 kind of thing. And my parents were very liberal. Like, it was news that this show was coming out, that people knew already, because Norman Lear, um, produced that show with like an agenda, you know, and it was going to be a different kind of show because it was going to bring out in an explicit way the political debates of the day. Really it was the political debates from five years previously because it, it was really, in a way, All in the Family is all about like 67, 68, like that's the moment that it's dealing with and it's especially about 
the generation gap and the counterculture versus the mainstream culture in the late 60s and, and early 70s. Um, but I remember watching it as a kid and thinking it was just, you know, so amazing. Um, but this is, so this is the thing about All in the Family that made it so unusual. Um, it looked like a regular family sitcom, you know, it was mom and dad with a daughter and the daughter got married and, um, but the difference was that the father, Archie Bunker, was a racist bigot. <laughs> and he didn't like black people and he thought women should stay in the home and he for sure didn't like these young kids protesting the Vietnam War and saying bad things about his hero, Richard Nixon, right? And um, so every show had that kind of a conflict. And the thing about Archie Bunker is he had these horrible ideas, you know, but he was kind of likable. And he was funny. He was played brilliantly by this great actor named Carol O'Connor. It was, a, again, it was a great ensemble cast. Every actor was great, except for Sally Struthers, but you didn't hear that from me. <laughs> but everybody else was just like really, it was just a really good show. Um, but it was just so unusual to have this character who would say these racist things, you know. And what the show did, it was the first show that I could think of that really did this, was it took that traditional structure, the narrative structure of uh, the family sitcom that would typically be you know, the kids make some mistake, and the father teaches them a lesson by the end of the episode, and all the family inverted that and completely put it on its head. And it was more the father would make a mistake, and the kids would teach the moral lesson at the end. So it was very much, it, it was the TV show of that 1960s generation, you know, yeah. And For me, it was, um, it was the first time I went, that's why I don't want to be. You know, right. You, you don't that, want to be Archie, Archie Bunker. Bunker. But you see Archie Bunker and go, man, I do not want to be that. Right. right. And, and I think that Although some of my students, I, I played a clip of All in the Family once and he was going off on something. <laughs> One of my students just shouted from the back of the room, I love this guy. <laughs> oh, I totally loved him, don't get me wrong. But no, I but he wanted to be like him. So. Yeah. And I think that helped yeah. me with a lot of things, you know, with yeah, racism, clarified sexism, and gay. Right. Clarify that. And they had everybody on Family. One of the things that I found was interesting about it was that, you know, in looking back on it, it was the, the way he acted and spoke out was kind of his fighting back against everything that he had held dear and that he had been promised in right. the 40s and 50s was being turned upside down. Right. So, yeah, he was a oddly likable character. Yeah. Because, you know, as much as he was spouting off these things that we were coming to realize were awful, you know, he was holding on with what he grew, you know, grew up at and fighting back at this world that was changing and being dumped on his head. <laughs> right. And, you know, he was basically a decent guy. He loved his wife. He loved his daughter. He hated when the black family moved in across the street, but he talked to them. You know, well, he would say racist things to them, but he talked to them. You know what I mean? There was like Lionel with the son, right? And, you know, he would have these constant discussions with the father. But right. there was, yeah, an interesting give and take and good relationship in right. the midst of all this. There was right. a lot of brilliant about it. Best moment in TV is when Sammy Davis Jr. kissed him. Uh, that never happened in the 70s. I didn't think it happened uh, a decade after. Do you remember that one? That moment? Mm -hmm. But you're making me want to watch it, but I, I don't know if I can do it right now. <laughs> I mean, that's so let's all watch that on YouTube tonight. Though. A man kissing a man and a black man at that. And yeah. uh, the look on Archie Bunker was just spectacular. So there's a character in a television show that's running today that's an Archie Bunker type of character. Do you know who I'm thinking of? Jack Donaghy? Well, I can see why you'd say that, but that's not what I was thinking. That's not what I'm looking for, though. Jack Donaghy's more just like a Republican. <laughs> a really funny Republican. <coughs> no, there's somebody that's really very Archie Bunker, racist, sexist, says the worst things that anyone has ever said on television. House. Who? House. No. Family Guy. Family Guy's a good guess. It's not who I'm thinking of, though. There's somebody that's very Archie Bunker.
that you all know who it is. Well, half of you. Cartman. Think about it. Cartman. He's racist. He makes fun of Jews and black people. And I mean, he likes Adolf Hitler. You know? But sometimes you put words like that into a, a voice of a certain character, and then it gives you a means of playing around with those ideas and exploring them a little bit. Yeah. Cartman also has his traits. He's kind of likable. He's smart. He's persistent. You know, He gets great lines sometimes. He gets the funniest laughs. He often drives the narrative. You know. And it works in the context of South Park because, well, on, one, on the one hand, the show is against racism, of course, but also the show just makes fun of everybody. Everybody makes fun of them in South Park, I think. You know, the Mormons, the Jews, but nobody gets it like the Scientologists get it. <laughs> <laughs> Any Scientologists in there? There must be a lot of Scientologists, though. They're in LA. They're all in LA. <coughs> You know what a Scientologist is? Believe in science. No, that's not it. A lot of you need, I, you need to watch the South Park episodes on Scientology, and you could learn about it. It's a it's a religion that was invented by a science fiction writer, and has become very popular with a lot of celebrities. But they also have a reputation for being like a cult and controlling their members and abusing a lot of people and stuff like that. Isn't it that there. like you believe in yourself to be like your power or something? You gotta watch the South Park episode. There's so much to it. It's fascinating. Yeah, they really explain it good. Anyway, but I don't want to go into that. <laughs> so here's some other comments that I want I want to make before I try to push out into some other things. Um, you know, first of all, I've just sketched this idea of, of gender, and you can see it changing. Then, you know, the 90s come along, and everyone's got cable, and then that opened up the possibility for more adult-themed programming, and then you got Sex and the City, which was this very explicitly, um, well, obviously, it's, it's a show that was an explicit exploration and discussion of all kinds of modern sexual practices, and it, and it showed, you know, women being very independent and, you know, self-consciously and intellectually self-reflecting on the inheritance of the sexual revolution. You know, I, I liked Sex in the City. I thought it was a great show and I think it, it brought the whole discourse of, of, of public, public discourse about sexuality up a level and it made it okay to talk about sex, which is really what the show was about. It was about talking about sexuality, which to my way of thinking is Good, healthy thing to do. Race is a really interesting thing to, thing to be thinking about in the history of, of TV. And I, if I had more time, I would go through and do a whole history of uh, not a whole history, but at least a little bit of a walking tour of, of race. There's less shows to choose from because television has been so racist. It's just unbelievable. And the way that it's especially been racist is not so much in deploying race, racist stereotypes on TV, is it's just erased black people. You know what I mean? Like there's just not, to this day, black people are massively underrepresented in TV shows. For sure, 50s, 60s, 70s, you know, once in a while there'd be some blacks on TV shows, and some of them were really interesting. Um, I brought up Good Times, which is a really challenging, interesting TV show. What was it? Um, Sanford and Son um, was a, a black thing TV show. The Jeffersons, obviously, which was a, sorry about that, which was a spin-off of uh, All the Family, was a TV show. Um, and, and interesting, and you can see Cosby is a really interesting one, too. Um, and you can, the, the sort of thing that I'm talking about with gender, <laughs> You could see it there with race, too. That on the one hand, oh my god, television, so sexist. But on the other hand, every <coughs> show has like, it's sexist in one way, and then kind of feminist, anti-sexist in another way. And every decade, that, that dialogue gets played out in a different way. And some shows that seem like they're very sexist really have an anti-sexist impulse. And then some shows that seem like they're anti-sexist actually wind up having a very sexist impulse. And I think that you can make the same kind of an argument about race, that some of the shows that were 
clearly designed to be anti-racist were actually pretty damn racist. Like for example, if you think about it, that stupid show that had that poor short black guy. Well, what am I thinking? Mm -hmm. You know, different uh, Coleman, different, strokes. different strokes. Yeah, you know, I mean that show screwed up Gary Coleman, and it was a screwed up show. And it's a screwed up idea for a show if you think about it, because all, it's all about the white man coming to save these poor black kids, and there's no black people going to save those black kids. And you need a nice white man to come save the black kids. You know, what I mean, like the standard kind of way that 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 racist whites like to look at blacks, which is there's this white burden that we need to save them, you know, which if you think about it is really disrespectful, right? Um, and then you've got a show like The Cosby Show. And The Cosby Show, sorry, I got that turned off. You know, um, in knowing something about the, <laughs> The thing about the Cosby Show, wait, I gotta stay in my window. <laughs> um, Bill Cosby has been very explicit in critiquing certain aspects of African American culture. And he makes the argument that part of the problem that African Americans have is that their culture doesn't cultivate enough self-respect and discipline and respect for women. And you'll hear him critiquing rap music and the use of the N-word and stuff like that. And you know, when he does this, he does this with a, with a lot of credibility because Bill Cosby is a comic genius. And he's an incredibly funny guy. And he never did any kind of blue material. You know, looking back, I didn't real. When I was a kid, I will always remember this. I was going. Me and my friends were looking through my dad's LP collection, and we came across this record, and it was Bill Cosby. And we were kids. We were like 10 years old or something like that, 11 years old. Man, what's this? Let's put it on the turntable and play it. And honestly, I can still remember that day listening to that Bill Cosby record with my friend. Like, it was like the best time we ever had in our lives. We, we never laughed so much. We were laughing till we were crying. Tears coming down our <laughs> eyes, unable to breathe, seriously wondering, are we going to die from lack of air because we can't stop laughing. It was just like so incredibly funny. It was the, it was the record that had his bit about Noah. You ever hear that? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, it's funny. And we had never heard anything like it before. And it was just, at that point in my life, it was just, it was the funniest, most amazing thing. We just played it again and again. And, you know, and of course, then he did um, Fat Albert, which was, again, it was about that kind of a thing. He was trying, he was trying, he, he had a certain strategy with regard to the problem of racism. And his strategy was, you know, racism exists in, in part because it's negative stereotypes, and I'm going to counter negative stereotypes with positive images of black people. That's what I'm going to do in Fat Albert, and that's what I'm going to do in The Cosby Show. And so The Cosby Show had black people who were like upper middle class. You know, he was a doctor, she was a lawyer, they had this big family of wonderful, successful kids, and everyone was doing great, it was funny and cute, and. You know, I describe the experience of watching The Cosby Show as I would turn it on and this kind of smile would come up on my face and I would just kind of smile the whole time. It was just such a sweet, fun show and we all watched it in the 1980s and it was a nice show. But you know, the thing about it is that show got critiqued by people by for being sort of, for erasing race. Because it was like, it was post-racial in a way. Race didn't matter in Cosby, and it never came up as a problem. And that was Cosby's point. But, but he would get critiqued by people by saying, you know, you've, you've, you've erased the specificity of our ethnicity on the show. You look white, you're an Oreo, they would call him. You know, black on the outside, but basically white. That could have been a white family. Race never came in at all. And then it would get critiqued in these more subtle ways, too, because it would be like, you know, not only does it erase the whole problem of race? But it's, it's very subtly racist because it has implicit in it 
a white standard of beauty. Look at the women. They're kind of fair skinned. The only really dark skinned ones are Bill Cosby and the son Theo. All the women, they're all, my Brazilian friends would call them, uh, well, not, not, not. they're kind of, they, they look like dark skinned white ladies. Their, their facial structures, you know, that Felicia Rashad and I forget, Lisa Bonet, you know what I mean? It was just, it was just this subtle thing that it got, it got, it just got tweaked a little bit. And anyway, it's just an example of how complex it was. And, you know, of course, the answer to the problem is you just have to have lots of shows about black folks and doing all kinds of things would be the better thing. And, you know, when there's so few shows about black families, suddenly there's a lot of pressure on that show to do everything to correct all the problems, and of course that won't happen. But I'll point on a show, my favorite, one of my favorite shows ever, and certainly my favorite show that deals with racial issues is Boondocks. You guys ever hear of Boondocks? You don't even know what it is, it's a cartoon. It's an animated cartoon, and it's, it's stunning, and it's brilliant. It's, it's like a South Park in the sense that it holds nothing sacred, and it does really hard satire, really hard biting satire. And it uses the N-word a lot. Like it, it has this one episode where it does what if. And the what if is what if when Martin Luther King Jr. was shot, he wasn't killed, he was just put into a coma. What would have happened? And what would have happened is, number one, he wouldn't have been treated like a martyr in the way that he was. So he wouldn't have been like this super famous guy. He would have just been kind of a somewhat middle level activist who wouldn't have quite gotten so famous. And then um, they had him moving through this world that looked a lot like the world that Cosby complains about, where the black people just are too disrespectful toward each other and they use the N-word too much, and then they have King just blow up at everybody at, at the end of it. And it's just, it's stunning, it's stunning. Anyway, it's a really provocative show. I would encourage you guys to check out The Boondocks. Anyway, I'm talking about any comments on any of this stuff so far? Any more comments? I was just gonna ask, have you ever seen that 30 Rock episode where Black Knights are after Tracy Jordan because he's ruining stereotypes with his character and like it's like over ruining for you to cause Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, Chappelle had that problem. That's another show that Chappelle did the opposite of what Cosby did. Cosby said, I'm gonna counter negative stereotypes with positive images. Chappelle went in and he said, I'm gonna occupy those negative stereotypes and exaggerate them even a little bit more so you can see what they are and I'm going to play with them a little bit. And he, you know, his show became incredibly popular. And he started to get troubled though. He, he had the problem that that guy, um, I'm forgetting his name now. Anyway, Chappelle had a problem with his audience because Clearly, a certain fragment of the audience was watching it because they were enjoying the racial stereotypes and they were using it to make fun of black people. You know, well, there's this there was this comedian who was super sexist, um, and he, he would like do these dirty limericks. Andrew Dice Clay. Andrew Dice Clay. He had a problem that was similar to the problem that Andrew Dice Clay had. You can watch Andrew Dice Clay in the way that I did, where it's all ironic. And you realize that he's actually inhabiting the character of an ugly sexist, but he's not an ugly sexist. He doesn't really mean that. He's just having fun playing with these sexist jokes. Chappelle did that, but and, and Andrew Dice Clay then would wind up having a certain amount of his, of his audience that were just sexist gorillas who were getting their Neanderthal worldview affirmed, you know what I mean? It's, career blew up as a result of that was Chappelle, he flipped out himself over it and he's just like, I've had enough. That and I think that he had some bad problems with Fox and that they were wanting to control the show in some weird ways and he just, he just chucked it all. But anyway, it, you know, it speaks to the issue that I'm having, the, the big issue that I'm just trying to, oh, I'm, the only point I'm trying to make is television is a cultural forum 
for discussing ideas of identity, including gender, race, age, sex, that, sexuality, that, that sort of thing. That's the point. Any comments or questions here? We've got 10 minutes left, and I'd like only made one point out of 10. Let me run down this list here and see if there's some things I might say in a bullet point type of form. The economics of broadcast television, the main thing that I want you to know is that the, in the old days, television was supported by these things that we called commercials. <laughs> and the commercial advertisers would pay money to the networks to show their commercials to you. And you'd watch a TV show and then it would get paid for by the commercial sponsors. And you know, the main thing that I want to point out to you about that is the thing about television is it, it presents itself to you, the viewer, as if it's here to entertain and inform you. That's what it feels like. I want to be entertained and, enter and informed. I'm going to watch TV. That's what it's there for. That's what its purpose is. But what I like to point out is that television is not there to entertain and inform you any more than a fisherman is there to feed a fish worms. <laughs> if you're the fish, it's all about the worm, you know, but if you're the fisherman, you know, it's all about the hook and getting a big pile of fish that you could sell. And that's how broadcast television works. It presents itself to you as if it's all about the worm. But it's not about the worm, it's about the hook. It's not about the television show, it's about the commercial. And the thing that gets bought and sold on TV is you. You're actually the product. You think that the product is the TV show. The TV show is not a product, it's just a lure. You're the product. You get your eyeballs, your attention. You get hooked up in a net and sold to the, to the advertiser. And that's important to think about because if you think that television is there to enter, inform and entertain you, you'll relate to it in a certain way. You're like, oh, that's, I can trust my TV shows. I can trust my commercial television news shows because it's there to inform me. But it's not there to inform you. It's there to get you to eat toxic products like hamburgers and milkshakes and candy bars and do all these horrible things like buy a motorcycle. I love motorcycles, but I know it's no good for me, so that was the example I came up with. Every day I have to make myself not buy a motorcycle. <laughs> I used to have to make myself not buy a double cheeseburger, but now it's become easy. But anyway, I digress. The point is that um, television, we think it's there to entertain and inform, but really it's there to sell you products. And that's what dictates the, the content of uh, television shows. That's why there's so few black people on TV. Because the advertisers don't give a damn about black people. They want to advertise to the people that have more money. And because we live in a racist society where whites have more advantages than blacks, white people are more likely to have money. And so TV shows are made for them. That's why, what was the TV show with the two black kids? What was it called again? Different Strokes. Different Strokes. That's why it was a white man with two black boys instead of a black man with two white boys. Black man with two white boys gets arrested. <laughs> white man with two black boys gets a medal. <laughs> there you go. You know, and that's the case with television news too. That's why television news sucks so bad. Because it's really not there to inform you. You really think it is. It's really just there to get ratings and that's why it's all sex and car crashes and murders and celebrity sex scandals and congressional sex scandals and you know but if you go look at PBS which isn't commercially driven it's completely different you got Muppets you got Jim Lair you got Gwen Eiffel you know those are the people on the news hour that actually give you the news it's <laughs> like oh that's what's going on thank you now I understand. So anyway, you should know that stuff. Um, I told you guys this. When I talked about radio, we talked about the FCC and that kind of thing, right? Uh, you know, everything else you could get out of the chat.